Welcome to this episode of the Selling Through Partnering Skills podcast, where I'm joined by Rajiv Nathan or Raj Nation. Raj, hi. Hi, thanks for having me. You got it right. <laughs> I, I did. So I'm going to introduce you, but I'm not going to do what I normally do, which is sort of do my interpretation. I'm just going to look at your LinkedIn bio here. So I've never done okay. this before. Yeah, I, I think it's a bit lazy way to introduce somebody, but I just got to read out what it says here, mate. Chief pit up pitch artist at Startup Hype Man. So you're going to craft a narrative that doesn't suck with visionary pitch decks and demo coaching. Cool. Get that. Speaker. Excellent. Professional announcer and MC. The original rapperpreneur and yogi. <laughs> Correct. Okay. So I think we get professional announcer and MC. Original rapperpreneur. Can you just yeah, the rapperpreneur. Yeah, yeah. Rap-preneur. Um, I'm even saying it wrong. I can't even say it wrong. You know, I make I make hip hop business content. So I'm also a rapper. Um, and so the way I've infused hip hop into startup hype man is we'll make you know we'll make fun music videos that have to do with you know, business stuff. Um, we'll create songs that have to do with business stuff with sales, you know, whatever happens in this wide, wild world of sales and wild world of business. So that's why I say rappreneur uh, in that sense. And, you know, I think the first day LinkedIn rolled out video on its platform four years ago, the first thought I had in mind was, Oh, let me put a rap video up. And so I just did a little like freestyle and threw it on. Uh, and yeah. And so that's what kind of, you know, the hype man, the startup hype man brand uh, one of the things we've we've come to be known for is the content we'll create, which is oftentimes, um, you know, hip hop influenced. And so that's why I say the rappreneur. So cool. I know my wife and some of my friends have probably listened to this going, Fred, don't go there. Don't go there. They're thinking, don't do vanilla ice with him. Please don't. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, they're thinking, you're going to say, yeah, I'm a rapper too. I sing vanilla ice at my own wedding. <laughs> <laughs> And you're nice. thinking, yeah, nice. I know. Let, let, should we move? Fa- Let's move swiftly on and try and make this yeah. a more salesy. And right. the yogi bit, actually, just before we move on, the yogi bit. I'm also a yoga instructor, um, right. so I don't have a whole lot of free time on my hands. <laughs> Doesn't sound <laughs> between like. between hype man, between um, between uh, hip hop, uh, the you know the announcing stuff. I do I do professional combat sports ring announcing. Um, so I'll literally you know, and in this corner, right? I'll do that for professional MMA. Uh, an amateur MMA. And then, um, yeah, I, I've been teaching yoga for about five years now. Um, and, you know, I think if anyone's hearing this and they're like, that's an interesting smattering of stuff. Um, it's all different, like passions of mine that I yeah. just found ways to turn into part of my profession. And also for me, it all comes back to this idea of having a voice and being able to help give people a voice, being able to help create expression and using different modes of storytelling to unlock those things. So, you know, all of my pursuits are just different vehicles of storytelling, ultimately in the name of giving people a voice or, or, or enabling expression in the world. And so that's, you know, that's why I do each of these things. And, you know, the stuff I get more curious about and the stuff I get involved in, they're all, you know, sometimes at a conscious, oftentimes at a subconscious level, uh, they are all in the name of expression. Brilliant. No, it's so cool. Uh, Just before we we turn the recording on, we're talking about sort of doing things that that are aligned to your purpose because you will do stuff better like that. So in this instance, what I want to talk about is how salespeople can can use some of this thinking. And and the people who listen to this will know that I'm going to bring this into the the way that uh, PQ or partnering skills uh, can help. So, you know, with, with those with those kind of those angles, that lens that you've got, let's have a think about trust. You know, how can salespeople build trust with customers? You know, maybe does storytelling help with this? Storytelling definitely helps build trust. Um, I, I think in the sense of if you can tell a well-crafted story and you can deliver it the right way, it helps position you as a thought leader, right? And people will trust thought leaders. Um, I think the other thing it does is it it gives the customer, the prospect, something different to latch on to, to where, you know, you know, one of the things like when we build um, pitch decks for companies, you know, one of our goals with the deck is to get the, the prospect to say to themselves, huh, you know, 
I never thought of it like that before. Right. And when you can get someone to say that to themselves, now they're really listening and they are going to trust, you know, pretty much every word that you say. And that's going to be so fundamentally different than what they're used to hearing from, you know, the six other vendors they've talked to along the way. Right. And so I think, yeah, storytelling is definitely a huge way towards building trust. I also think um, you can build trust in the sales process by, you know, of course, being honest along the way, but also having intentional like expectation setting or resetting along the way. So one example of that would be, you know, when I, when I do the demo coaching with clients, one of the things we'll work on is making sure they set an agenda at the beginning of their call. And it sounds like so menial, but you know, there's actually some data from the conversation intelligence company, Wingman. Uh, it's like only 4% of calls have, like set an agenda, but they correlate to 120% win rate. Um, wow. And the reason why it's important is, you know, it's not just like a table of contents. Um, it is what, like what you're doing when you set an agenda at the start of the call is essentially kind of like offering table stakes for the person you're talking to. You're saying, hey, here's how I see today going and here's what I'd like to get out of today. How does that align with your expectations? You know, does, does that work for you? Is there anything you want to add to that agenda? Right. So you, you have a mutual buy-in at the start that way. And, you know, to use your word partnership, the call feels like a partnership. The call is now a collaborative endeavor mm -hmm. as opposed to, hey, I'm just going to dive right in and you're along for the ride because I decided to dive right in. And what about even sending the agenda beforehand when you're setting the meeting up, whether we're doing Zoom, whether we're going to be rocking to put someone's business, whether they're coming to see us? Yeah, I think that's helpful. I think it's really helpful. So, and, and I don't think it needs to be an intensive thing that you send ahead of time. It can just be like a rough run of show, but I would still reiterate it at the beginning of the call because you don't necessarily know if they read it or paid attention to it. Yeah. And you could just say, hey, I sent you something ahead of time just, uh, just as like a quick reminder. Here's how I see today going. And I want to yeah. confirm that, that, that that's good with you. I think if you're going to do it, you might as well send it. Because mm -hmm. we know what people's diaries are starting to look like now. The old patchwork quilt. And you look at this thing and you think, I can't remember what that's <laughs> I like called. that. I like and, it. It's all the different colors, uh, right? Oh, they are. Yeah, they're mine. Is mine. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> like, well, what is that? Don't know what it is. Gone. Oh, it's got an attachment to it. And I would say there's an attachment. Ah, ah right. Okay. The, the, the purpose, the stuff at the top of the agenda, that's what it's all about. Okay, they're mm -hmm. good, fine. The guy's got it controlled. He's thought about it. He's planned it. That's great. So you stay yeah. in the you stay in the, in the diary. Then when they you're using it, so as I sent you, and you do exactly what you said. So, so I, I think you can you can get your your first impressions in, or you can make the meeting start working before you even get there. That's why yeah. I, I would I would send it. That's why I encourage. Um, One thing um, that I want to add to that too, in terms of building trust by delivering an agenda at the beginning of the call or reiterating the agenda that you sent ahead at the beginning of the call, is it helps build trust. Because if you deliver the agenda the right way, you don't just say, hey, here's what's gonna, here's what I'd like to happen today. You actually use it as an opportunity to tease out what next steps would look like if there's a fit, you know, what typical next steps look like when there is a fit. And then it makes it easier at the end of the call to bring up next steps. I think one of the biggest things salespeople struggle with is how to actually secure next steps at the end of a call. Yeah. And I say build trust because it shows you know what you're doing instead of, you know, kind of like just figuring it out along the way. And then like uncertainty <laughs> is not, is not a, it's not a, a thing a buyer wants to feel like on the other, like, oh, the person I'm talking to is unsure of what's supposed to happen. Like, that's not a, that's not a place that's going to build trust. Um, you want to feel like the vendor you're talking to, the person you're potentially buying from knows what they're doing. Right. And if you can, if you have that opportunity up front where you give the agenda and then you say, and you know what, if we feel like there's a fit by the end of this, typically when there is a fit, next steps look like blank. Yeah. Now you've, you've, you've essentially laid out the roadmap for them. So now they feel more comfortable in your process. Yeah, I, I love it. And I think there's another thing goes on with this. It helps less experienced salespeople. So I, one of the things I've found is that someone who's newer they aren't as good at asking questions, not because they don't know how to, but they feel as they've got to show that they know stuff. 
And they think, if I ask questions, the customer might think I don't know. Mm -hmm. And so what you're saying is, look, I do know what I'm doing here. This is the way we're going. I am, it doesn't say this, but I am going to ask you questions. Yeah. <laughs> that's what yeah, happened. Of course. Then of course. I might tell you this stuff and then we'll decide what's going to happen next. Bang, that's there. So when that's set out, it's, that is what I'm going to do. And you give yourself permission to ask questions and to be curious and do all the stuff that we know that works. Yeah. So for yeah. less experienced salespeople, it works quite well as a way of self-management as much as anything else. So, um, no, cool. Let's. So you're actually talking about it a little bit. You start talking about, you know, we want to collaborate. We want to work together on stuff. We want to be in this thing together. So, you know, we have this win-win focus. So yeah, setting the agenda, setting the meeting up works well. What other things could we do? to sort of make sure we're keeping on track with that? I think how you talk about your, whatever you're selling, your product, your service, et cetera, your offering, that's another way you can create win-win and, and build on the trust. Um, so there, you know, the, I think what every company needs is a strong elevator pitch, right? Um, the sound bite about what your offering is. So that way you don't, you know, when it's time for you to explain it, your jump off point is not a five minute diatribe where they caught, you know, a couple of words along the way because you droned on and didn't necessarily know your starting point or your stopping point. And so that's why I, I'm such a big proponent and one of like the anchors of my whole brand is getting your elevator pitch, right? Um, the formula um, that we've created with this, I call it the K-Pasa elevator pitch formula. Um, now, being in the UK, you may not know Spanish, but in the US, many of us know, know at least some conversational Spanish or have heard the phrase que pasa before. Have you heard that phrase before? Si quieres que hacemos todo este podcast en español, ese me vale igual. Puedo hacer Whoa! Whoa! With what accent and everything. You just what? blew my mind. What a show off. <laughs> but you're right. Not many English people would speak Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Did mate, you spend time in Spain or something? Yeah. Yeah, that's my amazing. Degrees in commerce and Spanish. I lived in Madrid for a year, and I've used it in work ever since I graduated. So yeah. that's incredible. That's incredible. <laughs> so I don't know if so in Mexico, que pasa is a colloquial yep. phrase. Is it in Spain yep. as well? Yeah, same. Okay, so then you obviously know que pasa means what's up or what's happening, right? It's like a greeting, yep. right? Like what's up, you know, que pasa, amigo, what's up, friend? Um, that's so when you're giving that elevator pitch of your company, that that introduction to what you offer. You just need to tell people what's up and what this breaks down to is que pasa is an acronym P-A-S-A, -A, which stands for problem, approach, solution, action, problem, approach, solution, action. The reason I say this helps create a win-win is because if you look at most sales calls, most demo calls, most discovery calls, when the person starts talking about their company, the seller starts talking about their company. They will say, yeah, so, you know, we're a AI powered, um, you know, intelligence platform. Uh, we have neuro-linguistic programming built in. Um, we've been around for about a decade and a half now working with some of the biggest brands. Uh, we've won these awards um, and this is what you get out of it. Now that's delivered with this intention to impress them. And it's just a lot of, it's a, it's a mouthful of buzzwords. And it's diving into the offering or the solution too soon. So you create a win-win by putting yourself on their side first through that K-Pasa lens, the K-Pasa formula, problem, approach, solution, action. So when you start talking about your offering, you, you only talk about it through the lens of what your customer base was experiencing before they came to your company or what, you know, what that target audience is currently experiencing, right? You talk through the lens of pain or problem first. And you use that as the natural lead-in to your to what it is that you do to resolve that, right? We all know we have to talk about a solution, but then a solution only exists if there were a problem in the first place. So essentially, you're providing context and frame of reference for your offering. Most importantly, you lead with empathy. You essentially, you know, you open by saying, you know. I get that things are tough. I get that this is happening. That's real. Like that sucks. Totally understand that. That's why we've done something about it. And here, here's what we do about it. And so that's how you, you essentially put yourself on their side from the start, which is going to help create that win-win. Love that. Love, love Kipasa. 
Oh, I might well be borrowing that. <laughs> Go for it. Go for it. No, no, it, it's really, but it just makes sense. And and it's interesting. Some people, I, I try to work with, well, I do. I do work with people on the elevator pitch. And you kind of say, oh, no, we know how to do this. We did this. We did this three years ago. Did this four years ago. Did it on a basic sales training. Okay, tell me. And they do go on and on and on and on because they've kind of got into bad habits or maybe not trained well. Mm-hmm. And, and, and everyone know, will tell you something different pra- too. <laughs> we've got to keep practicing it and making it shorter. And making something short and concise is hard. Yeah. I, I yeah. don't know. I, I, I've always attributed this wrongly, but it was, um, you know, why did you write me such a long letter? I didn't have time to write you a short one. Yeah. <laughs> I always thought it was Churchill, but I think it goes back even further than I that. Think, so, I thought it was like Hemingway maybe, but. Uh, uh, just put any, any any kind of good person with words to that and everyone will kind of yeah. go, yeah, it's probably him. Exactly. I, Mark, Mark Twain's another one that springs to mind, but. but uh, yeah, potentially. But, you know, that's the idea, right? You, you know, and that K-Pasa formula is designed to deliver something in, you know, anywhere from like 25 to 60 seconds. Yeah. Uh, and it gives them just enough to be curious to learn more, right? You don't like yeah. bludgeon them over the head with information. Yeah. You tease out just enough to then like set the table to explain more. Yeah. Oh, how'd you do that? Well, I just need to ask you a couple more questions actually to really find out exactly what yes. we would do. Earn yes. the right, move into it, into a conversation. Um, Okay, so, so the next thing I want to ask you about, and again, the, these, the great thing about PQ, when I came across it, I liked it so much. These things are interlinked. And if a salesperson starts thinking like this, their approach gets better. Mm-hmm. Because one of the other elements is interdependence or comfortable being interdependent. So I mean, we're already talking about ways to do this, but what other things could you perhaps advise people, or advise salespeople on to do that and to really make sure that's what they're, they're aspiring towards? Interdependence, interesting. Um, can you maybe give me an example so I can orient yeah. my response? To that? Yeah, well, no. The, 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 way, the way I think about it, in very simple terms, is that as a salesperson, my success is going to be determined by your success as a customer, because I'm trying to sell you outcomes. You've got to get those outcomes. You've got to do those things. Yeah, and if you do, happy days, because then we can look for renewal, and actually, I'll get a good you know, track record, referrals, all all that good stuff. But you've got to do your side. So yeah, really, our, we we do become entwined. Yeah, that, that's particularly for sort of the okay. more complex. I think, I, yeah, I think I understand what you're saying now. Okay. So I think one way you can do that effectively is by not thinking that just because you're the salesperson in the, in, in the relationship that 100% of the work is your responsibility. So you'll see a lot of these interactions where you get to the end of the call and the seller is like, Okay, great. So coming out of this, I'll send you this. I'll send you this. I'll talk to my team about this other question you had. I'll get you an answer for that. And I'll, and I'll get you this as well. And they've committed to doing all this work. And they don't even have a, a commitment from the buyer to like follow up with them or do anything on their side. So it's like, if you're going to, like, you got to make sure both people have some skin in the game. If you're going to do all this work at minimum, you should have a follow-up meeting scheduled, right? They should be tasked with, you know, bringing whoever, you know, partner to that meeting, you know, whatever, you know, internal stakeholder coming comes to that next meeting so that the next thing can be discussed. Um, I need you to send me this information first so that I can get you these other answers, right? Once someone's done that, now they're a little bit more vested in seeing it through to fruition. Um, you know, as opposed to, hey, let me do these 10 things for you. And you've made zero commitment in return. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, again, I think we come back to the maturity of the salesperson in that they say, no, you, again, it does take two to tango. We've both got to get involved with this. And it is a fair ask. If I'm doing all these things, actually, I probably do take a lot away. But there is some other, some other things you're going to have to do. I mean, why, you know, like why, why should I as the seller let's have something for me to come back and show that I've done all these things? Yeah. yeah. You know, why should I as the seller take, you know, reasonably 30 to 45 minutes out of my day, out of my day when I could be prospecting or talking to another prospect, you know, on, on a, on a call um, to do all this work for you when I don't even know if you're going to even respond to my follow-up email. Yeah. And the other interesting thing you said, as you're explaining that is I'm going to go back and get my team to do it. You know, it's a team game. And it's yeah, like the and you take other resources out. Yeah. So the interdependence is you're, you're dependent actually on your own team <laughs> as well as the customer and the, probably the customer's team. That Everyone's coming together on this. Good salespeople yeah. will get this and they can start to coordinate that. 
I also which is, think, which is a, good, a real skill because people that actually aren't reporting to them, they don't work for them. <laughs> They're yeah. trying to get all these people to do this stuff. Well, and, and one thing to, that that brings up as well for me is, you know, some of those answers that you, you know, do need to find internally. Honestly, a lot of times people are given the same exact request. So it would be, it would just behoove you to just record, you know, a Vidyard video, for example, explaining the answer to that question. And then you just keep reusing that same video when, when it comes up again, you know, instead of you just, you just don't start by saying, Hey, Fred in the video, and then send it to Paul the next time you just say, you know, you have a, you have a generic opening, right. And you say, Hey, yeah. so you asked the question about this, you know, here's the response to that. And then you don't have to, you know, maybe, maybe you ask your internal resource one time and then you can, you, know, you like essentially call down that response and then put it into a video and then just drop it in an email. Because guess what? They're probably going to watch a 30 second video more than they would read paragraphs in an email. Yeah. This podcast is not sponsored by Vidyard, by the way. <laughs> no, however, Tyler has been on it. Tyler Lesson oh, awesome. on it awesome. and was incredibly generous with his with his information. It was it was a brilliant you know, masterclass in using video, all the elements. So yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan man. of it. I'm ha- <laughs> I, I, I reckon I'm one of his best salespeople in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's really cool. No, and, it, and it's a good modern way of selling that certainly, I mean, I work all over, but, you know, clients in the UK, they're still getting their head around it. There is still an opportunity to be a bit of a leader with this stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. big time, big time. We could go down a massive rabbit hole because this is your air, is it? This is getting your pitch across. This is getting your face. This is getting your voice. This is getting your personality. This is getting the, the whole lot. Well, give us another three or four minutes on why video so much. I mean, to touch on some of the things you just said there, right? Now your personality is coming across. It's a more personal relationship, right? They've not only seen you on a, you know, on a Zoom call or whatever, but then your follow-up is more of your face, more of your voice. So it's going beyond the product you sell or the company you represent. Now they're building a relationship with you. Um, I, again, I think, and the data is there. Videos will just get watched. It's, it's an easier medium to get your message across than, again, sometimes emails will be like paragraphs long to explain a response. Um, and you're also spending a long time typing up and retyping up that response. Um, so I think, I think those are, as part of the follow-ups, I think video is really helpful. Again, you can rinse and repeat. So, you know, I mean, for me personally, right? Um, one section of my market is uh, early stage companies who need investor pitch help. And that's usually a one to two call close situation because it's, you know, it's just a smaller project overall. Inevitably, I would say 85% of the people who I talk to on that first call will say, can you show me some examples? And so what did I do? I heard that enough times and I just pre-recorded a video and, you know, I, I like, I like Vidyard, so I use it. Um, I, up, I just upload it into Vidyard and I send them in a follow-up email. Here's some examples of pitch decks. And also here's some results. And it's just a bullet point list of here's some results uh, from people who have worked with us. So-and-so yeah. raised this much capital. So-and-so won this pitch competition, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And it's super easy <laughs> for yeah. them to watch. I think what's like a 90 second video. And I'll even tell them, watch it in 1.2 X or 1.5 X. Yeah. Right. So it takes even, it's even faster for them to consume it. They've got a list of the results right underneath that in the email. And I don't need to keep doing that every single time someone asks for results. I don't need to spend time on the call being like, here, let me open up this folder and show you this stuff. Right. It just makes it smoother. And since it's uploaded into a software, I can see that they've A, watched the video, and B, what percent of the video they have watched. And that's C, how many times. Yeah, and how many times. And if it's getting forwarded one person, the one decision maker has been watched 14 times. Yeah, okay. Either they're very slow, or (laughs) this is going around a bunch of people. Good sign, yeah. Uh, No, we could could carry on about video, but uh, yeah, no, brilliant stuff, brilliant stuff. Let's move on. Let's think about what I'm now labeling transparency. Um, however, transparency in the form of PQ, it's what originally Steve Dent talked about having this, this ability to be good at self-disclosure and feedback. So, so giving some information about yourself, 
but also giving some information to the customer about themselves. Mm. So again, how can you see this come into play as, as a way of helping a modern salesperson be better at what they do? I think when it comes to transparency, I'd be remiss if I did not say, I think Todd Capone is the master of transparency, the author of the book, Tran The Transparency Sale, um, where he talks all about the importance of being a transparent salesperson and a transparent selling organization where I think what's what's really amazing in his technique is he said he's he's like if you actually lead with your flaws, you'll have a better uh, interaction with your customers because it like you know essentially lets their guard down. Um, you tell them what you are doing and what you're not doing and why you're not doing those things. And, and again, you know, this is all pretty much like plucked out of his book, which I, which I think is just such a valuable read. It might be. Uh... You know what? No, I have it on a. I, I, I can see a book. a book about the rock. <laughs> yeah, I have a book about the rock back there. No, no, I, I have I have transparency <laughs> sale as an ebook, not as a physical book. But you know, like he, Todd talks about when he was chief revenue officer for um, a company called Power Reviews, they had this meeting with a huge retailer. I want to say it was like Calvin Klein or something, and you know, like he didn't even realize like he was going for a meeting. He just thought it was like a casual thing. Turned out he was meeting with like the head of whatever at Calvin Klein, who was like, you know, Hey, your competitor does this. Tell me, tell me how you do that better. And Todd took like, that's how the meeting started. He's like, we've been talking with your competitor. They do this. Why are you better? And Todd took a step back and was like, we, like, we, we literally like don't do that. And it's not on our roadmap. So if that's important to you, like, please proceed with them. Here's why it's not on our roadmap. And here's, here's where we specialize in instead. And he was able to like gravitate that person towards his company instead. Right. And, and, and he'll tell the story a lot better. If you haven't had him on the show, you should definitely have him as a guest at some point. Um, but that idea of just being transparent with them, saying what you do, but saying what you don't do and having a reason for why you don't do it. And also letting on like, you know what? Hey, so-and-so. I think they are better in that specific category or in that specific aspect. I think you'll, the, the other person will respect and appreciate you more yeah. than, than trying to either, I think, I think what I see a lot of sales leaders kind of teach to their teams and sales people then enact is like, do whatever possible to not bring up the, the competition. As if the buyer doesn't know that there's competition, that there's other vendors. Now, I will say this, where you, where you actually probably shouldn't bring up the competition willingly is in cases where you are uh, instead going for like category creation and you want to say, essentially the message you're getting across at that point is like, I don't know why we're talking about them. They're not even in the same conversation as us. We're over here, which I do think more and more companies should be stepping in that direction to say, that's not the same. We don't play in that sandbox. We're over here. But if that's not, you know, if you're in a more commoditized market, yeah, talk about who else is out there. I also think it's good to say, you know, because a lot of times, you know, buyers will say, okay, you know, after this call, we got to talk to a couple other vendors, right? And then we'll get back to you. I think what's a really good technique to do is plant a seed in your buyer's mind by giving them a question that they should ask all the other vendors. Totally, totally understand. You got to talk to everyone else. That's like, I would do that too. Uh, just do me a favor. Can you just do this one thing? Each, each of those vendors you talk to, ask them this and, you know, just take stock of what their responses are. I'm really curious to hear what they come back with. And have it be a question that, you know, your company probably is going to win out on the answer of. Yeah. Um, but that, you know, then you're almost essentially giving them a mission to go into these conversations through the lens that you'd like them to see it through. Yeah, I, I love that. Yeah, it's like, here's, here's a little tip. You just ask them that. Or I could try and batter the door down and keep saying, oh, we're there because we're there because we're there. Well, of course, you're going to say that your salesperson is. Of course. Come on, they're just going to wash over a little bit. So, yeah. That's, and that's everyone's going to say, oh, our algorithm is better, right? And it's like, okay, but everyone's algorithm is roughly the same. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I remember back in the day, I I learned technique, and actually, still, it's still it's still valid. You know, it's compare and contrast. So, our competitors do this, well, so do we. 
our competitors do this, so do we. Our competitors do this, so do we. But what we also do is that, that, and that. <laughs> so actually, you just call it out. You pre-frame mm. it. But I yeah. love the idea of rather than telling them, let them go find that out for themselves. Love yeah. that. Yeah, be like, I encourage you to talk to them. <laughs> and just, you know, make sure you ask them this question when you're talking with them. Make sure you ask them this question. Love it. Love it. Okay, let's keep moving on then because we know you've got a packed diary. <laughs> All those different <laughs> roles. <laughs> just remembering what you're supposed to be doing at any given time must be. <laughs> if, it's not on, if it's not on my calendar, it doesn't exist, personal or professional. <laughs> <laughs> it's not happened. Yeah, so it's not like CRF. It's not, it's not, yeah, it's it's not happened. It's not in Salesforce. It didn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> so change. <laughs> Comfort with change. Mm. Change in salespeople. Talk to me about that. Do you mean delivering the idea of change or uh -huh. the change of a person themselves, like as a seller? I've left it deliberately open to see where you'd go with okay. it. Okay. Yeah. I look at, <laughs> so yeah, it's the, okay. I look at change kind of through the lens of that storytelling idea, right? Yep. The story you tell, and, and again, I think the best way to do this is through a pitch deck um, because then there's a visual aid and the visual aid should be a good visual aid, not a bunch of slides that have a million words on them. Um, the story you tell should be one of a story of essentially market forces at play that are driving change, um, that are making companies do things differently. And because there's this general concept of change, essentially that's what you do. Like you deliver this idea of, hey, market forces are at play. So people are doing this now or, be, or being pushed in this direction. If you do that well, then like towards the end of your presentation, you then position your company, your product as the logical purveyor of that change. So whenever we build sales decks, it's kind of, it's like really counterintuitive and it takes a lot of convincing to the client, but 50%, 50 to 70% of the presentation I should say the first 50 to 70% of the presentation is not yet talking about the product or the offering or the service. You're building up this idea of doing something. And then, you know, at whatever, 51% or 71% in, you kind of flip the switch and you say, well, that change is what we deliver, right? And so you make yourself, again, the logical purveyor of change. And one of the techniques, you know, whenever possible, we try to execute in building up that story of the market forces and the need for change is we look at, can we deliver this through a, through an analogous scenario where they say, where you can say like, this is what it's like over, like, here's what it's like over there. And once they can, like, once the buyer agrees that you're like, well, what's happening over there is actually exactly what's been happening over here. And that's, you know, to, to call back to what I said earlier in this, in this podcast, that's when they say to themselves, huh, you know, I never thought of it like that before. That's really interesting. That has me thinking. I need to keep listening to what they have to say because they're thinking about this in a way we've never thought about this before. So they must really know their stuff. And then ultimately you get them to a point by the end where they essentially, they've essentially emotionally bought in to the idea of working. You know, there's always, you know, specifics that have to be worked out beyond that. But once they're emotionally bought in, the specifics are less of an uphill climb. And they ultimately will purchase because they're saying to themselves, I know they have a good product and everything, but honestly, it's not just that they have a good product. It's that Nobody sees the market. Nobody sees our industry the way they do. We've got to get on board their rocket ship because they're going to take us places. Yeah, it's uh, you have said it, and uh, it's one of the best things a salesperson can can hear. Yeah. Oh, never thought of it like that before. Job done. So, so you that teach them and, the process, right? Yeah. No, that and the other one is that's a really good question. Oh, I've mm -hmm. got to think about that. Yeah, and none of those happen by accident. If anyone reckons they can just rock up and get those responses with no prep, they're completely delusional. 
takes work, doesn't it? <laughs> no, it takes work. It does. It takes work. It really does. And and uh, you know, I've done the similar thing. You're trying to flip basically people's presentations because they all do lead, don't they? On the NASCAR slide, the map of the world, the little dots all over it. You know, the founder story. You know, two brothers yeah. back in the day did it, and it's like, oh, what? And I remember going through with this one particular company, and I said, so then we put this piece in, and then this, and they and they kept saying, but when do we talk about us? <laughs> they, they were stop <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a bit. No, but when do we talk about that's what they kept saying to me. When do we talk about us? And mm-hmm. I was like, this is hard. You know, for, we're doing this day in, day out, and it's kind of obvious that's what you do. You talk about them and what's affecting them. But the, the, the incident, but when, I did tell about me, 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 me. No, no, it's not. Yeah. It's hard. It's yeah, tough. it's 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 like the less you talk about yourself, the more attractive you'll become. Because, yeah. again, if you have that right buildup, it puts into context everything about your product to where you actually don't need to say as much about it because they understand the reasons behind it. Right. And they understand. And, and what you do is you, you try to position your product as aligned with the market forces you were talking about in the first place. Yeah. So then it just makes so much sense, right? Like, Oh, duh. Of course you do it that way because that's the way things are going. Right. And so what you're able to do in that, you know, that, that switch flip of, I never thought of it like that before is you're essentially you're teaching them something about their own situation in a way they have not considered previously. And that's, and to be honest, one other thing I want to touch on with that, that's also why, you know, it's a lot of time, you know, I think a lot of companies have products that have like multiple modules to them, right? Like multiple aspects to a product suite that can actually be, you know, you could purchase like one level of it or you could purchase the whole thing, right? The product can be piecemealed in a purchase is, is what I'm getting at. Yeah. It's also why as a salesperson, just because the person comes in saying, we have been really looking for a solution for this specific thing. And then what you'll see is most salespeople only talk about that thing, even though their offering might be larger than that. That's just, that's succumbing to their will. When instead, if you can teach them about their own situation, so they see their own situation in a way they hadn't considered before. Now you've, you're, bit, you're able to better unlock the full value chain of your offering because realistically, any company that has a product suite, the customer who invests in the entire product suite has the best experience. It's not just like, a, oh, I want to increase average order value here. I mean, you will do that. It's not just, oh, I want a bigger commission. I want a bigger contract. It's that... Our customers are most successful when they experience the product in full, not when they experience 25% of the product. And so that's why you don't just give in when they're like, oh yeah, yeah. So we've been looking for a solution for this. And you're like, in their head, a lot of salespeople are like, okay, well, I guess I'm just going to talk about that because that's what they want. And I always like to say, like, you know, when I'm, when I'm working with different teams, I'll be like, When you go to a doctor and you don't say, my shoulders hurt, I think I need surgery. The doctor's not like, you know what? We actually have an opening at one o'clock today. Do you want to get on the table? We can, we can get you in. No, they're like, okay, well, let's take a step back for a moment. Can you, can you raise your arm for me? Okay. Tell me where, tell me at what point. Okay. There. All right. Now, now move it forward and back. Does it hurt there? Okay. Um, what kind of activity do you do on a daily basis? All right. Can you, can you walk for me? I want to see what your gait, what your posture looks like. Right. And then they're like, you know what? I know your shoulder hurts, but actually this is a, this is a function of your low back muscles and they're forcing you to do this with your shoulder. And so you're like, well, thanks doc. Like I don't need, and, 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 and by the end they're like, you don't need surgery. What you need is physical therapy yeah. specifically targeting these areas. Yeah. No, it makes much sense. I mean, again, it's one of the, the phrases we, we all like our little catchphrases throw out is the it's yeah. prescription without diagnosis is malpractice. Uh-huh. Yes. <laughs> Which makes sense. I got to write that to... down. Prescription I, I, without I, I, diagnosis. Is I, I would have taken it from somewhere else. I'm recycling. I'm repurposing. You know? Yeah. Um, no, but it is. It's like we've got to work it out. And, and but sometimes, and we know salespeople just, oh yeah, great, sell that. It's like okay, well, definitely need to be about that. Let's put that to one side. Let's let's just look around this a little bit. And while, while we've got the chance, let me look at these other things. Saved you expensive surgery and pain. Different way of doing it. Far better um, solution. So. Um, I mean, we're just very briefly, then we're kind of moving into that kind of future orientation that a good salesperson has, anyway. So rather than thinking in the moment, it's like, oh, got to do this. Any other thoughts around, you know, how we can keep 
that 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 future focus in play as a salesperson. So I I, mean, I think as you saw kind of naturally, right? Like the story element touches on that, but I'll, let me take a different lens to this question, and I, let's talk about like procedural stuff where you put someone stories to everything. Right? Stories to all the boxes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so let's talk about like a procedural way to kind of go about being future oriented. Um, and and I think this comes to part discovery and then part you know next steps. So I think the average seller when they ask about timing, they will say, when do you want to have this live by? Or what's your timeline for this, right? Some variation of that question, which I think only gives you, I think it gives you an incomplete picture. And so I think what everyone needs to realize is there's always two timelines at play. There's the timeline that got you here and the timeline that gets us there. Here's what I mean by that. The timeline that got you here. Ask this question on your discovery calls. Hey, I'm just curious. How come we're having this conversation today and we didn't have it like two months ago or you know, we're not, we're not having it two months from now? Even if they were a lead, you know, an outbound lead that you prospected or someone on your team prospected, they didn't just say yes because they had two hours, you know, an hour free on their calendar and they're like, yeah, sure, I can kill some time. That's Friday right. afternoon, isn't it? Nothing bad. Today. Yeah. <laughs> There's a reason they responded in the moment and said, yeah, I'll take a meeting this week, right? Or next week. So you want to know what was the timeline that got us here. So you say, how come we're taking a meeting today and we didn't take it two months ago or two months from now? What they're going to do is tell you the events leading up to today and something that's driving, you know, driving, talking about this based on the future. So that gives you, you know, essentially half of the equation. And, and, and through that, they'll naturally kind of give you a... Um, an idea of when they're going to try and go live by with the thing. The other question to ask, the timeline that gets us there is, you know, so, so they tell you, yeah, you know, we, you know, we're thinking about having something in place by, you know, let's say mid-October. Then you come back and you say, okay, um, what happens if you don't go live by then? And now you get them to tell you the implications or ramifications of them not sticking to their own timeline. And you'll know if that is a real timeline or not. What happens if you don't go live by mid-October? Oh, you know, it's, if we go by live by November, it's no big deal. Okay, so now you can forecast better, right? Now you know that, that mid-October date they said is not as real as you initially thought it was. And you can do your part to, you know, get them to recognize urgency to, to bring that timeline closer. But you know, like there's not a real driving event. They just kind of said it. Or they're like, no, no, we have to get it launched by then because we've got this other project happening and that can't start until we get this part figured out. And now you've got a place to say, okay, wait, so let me get this straight. You've got this big overarching company goal. And what it, if I'm hearing this right, it sounds like that goal can only be achieved by getting started with this siloed thing that we're talking about. And without accomplishing this first, the whole thing gets derailed. Did I get that right? Yeah, you did. Okay. So I think, so, so it sounds like then mid-October is like, is, is, is the hard date. Let's work backwards from there because, you know, I can already see there's like two holidays on the calendar. How is that? Like, how do you see that interrupting the timeline or, or, you know, are there any you know, potential barriers that might come up along the way? Right. So now you actually build a realistic scenario and, and you have something to work off of and you have trigger events to come back to so that they stick to their own timeline not you trying to get them to commit to your timeline. Brilliant. Love it. Another quality piece of advice. You've given us some absolute crackers, Raj. Really appreciate that. Crackers. I I mean, to... yeah. Absolute crackers. Is that what you said? <laughs> crackers. Crackers as in good. Good things. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I, was, I was like things. giving people breadcrumbs. Like, like, no, 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 we're getting, we're getting crumbs. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> two nations separated by language. Um, yes. <laughs> no, crackers, crack it. It's good. It's a good okay. thing. I was paying like, like firecrackers. <laughs> firecrackers, that's the fella, yeah. Um, no, and I, we talk about time, and I just have to be respectful of your time. So, look, thank you so much. How can people get in contact with you? I'm, I'm sure people want to hear some more. Of course. Yeah, yeah. So definitely. So you can check out you know, our work at startuphypeman.com. Connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, Rajiv, Raj Nation, Nathan, if you type any of those, it should come up. Um, 
I've also, uh, when you connect with me, I've got a little like Easter egg on my profile. So I'll kind of give everyone a challenge, see if you can find the Easter egg uh, on my profile and I'll give you a clue. It's in the top half of the profile before you have to scroll. Um, the other thing too, that I think would be valuable, um, you know, during this conversation, I mentioned that K, the importance of the elevator pitch and I gave that K-PASA elevator pitch formula. Um, I'm going to imagine most people listening to this probably weren't like note taking while doing this. Maybe they were driving or working out or doing something else. So if you didn't get a chance to like write that down or take any notes on it, um, I, I have a, a K-PASA pitch guide that I've put together that walks through the formula step by step, the rationale behind it, and then with examples as well. Um, and even a, a, a video that pairs with it. So I want to just give that to your audience. Um, so go to startuphypeman.com slash Fred dash Copestake. So Fred, our host here, uh, that's basically, it's his name, startuphypeman.com slash Fred dash Copestake. And you can access that uh, pitch guide. Right generous to the last we will pop that as a link in with the in with the show notes your, your, your linkedin and the link in the show notes awesome. yeah um, and if so if they connect and they found the easter egg if they uh, they put that they heard it on here that'd be really cool but now look raj absolute pleasure really we could just carry on chatting but i, I do know you need to you need to dash um pleasure is all mine i appreciate it nah me, me too me too take care